Well, welcome everyone. Uh, and uh, thanks for being guinea pigs. Uh, sorry, it took a uh, pandemic to get us to figure out how to broadcast over Zoom and this newfangled internet thing, but we've finally done it and uh, we're excited to welcome all of you in person as well as our Zoom audience. And we've got, uh, it, we're able to now reach our members who are out of state as well as further out in the state. And we look forward to being able to, to do this for all future um, events. For those of you on Zoom, we're using the webinar version and so you will not be seen and you are muted. If you have questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A feature, and we will get to those at the end. We'll also take questions from the audience at the end, too. So if you've been around Indianapolis long, I know you share my excitement for the revitalization of the old Coca-Cola bottling company and its conversion into the bottle work. It's certainly one of the city's uh, and it's great to have it open to the public again. And it was be sure to check out Indiana Landmark's YouTube page for Emily Biles' talk on RC Engineering's efforts to restore the terracotta. I think you'll be interested in that. But our speaker tonight is Barbara Zeck, and she's a contemporary ceramic artist who's received multiple awards. In 2000, she traveled to Japan for research in ceramics and paper making. National Travels also took her to Kenya, where she co-founded a craft micro-enterprise for HIV-positive individuals. Barbara holds a BFA from here in design and previously worked as an art educator, providing therapeutic experiences for people with disabilities. Her original ceramic wall piece, custom tile, can be found in spaces, including Community North Hospital and Simon Cancer Center. We're delighted Indiana Landmark's before tour of the old Coca-Cola bottling company introduced Barbara to our organization and got her thinking about historic places. You can see her work on display during our sold out Chatham March and Bottle Works tour. I hope some of you got in on that. Um, and you can also find her work in a photo gallery at barbarazek.com. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming tonight and also for joining on Zoom. Um, like Suzanne mentioned, uh, I'm here to share my role in the Bottle Works transformation from the Coca-Cola plant to what it is now as a boutique hotel. Um, my primary role was working on the interior tile only, and as you mentioned, the exterior was renovated by a different company. Let's see. Oops. Let's see. Okay. This is what the Bottle Works Hotel looks like now. This Art Deco gem was designed by Rubush and Hunter architecture firm and built by Young Claws contractors around 1930. And uh, Rubush and Hunter designed various Coca-Cola plants throughout Indiana. So if you look them up, you'll find all kinds of similar buildings throughout Indiana. Their firm also designed more than 200 Indianapolis buildings including Circle Theater, IRT, Murat Temple, Madam Walker Theater, Tech High School, and the list goes on and on. Um, this, this photos show, which one is this one? The Circle Tower is shown here. And it was built around the same time as the Coca-Cola plant and shows a lot of the same Art Deco style. And Suzanne gave a really good introduction, so I don't need to tell you who I am or what I do. <laughs> um, but before I got into the, before I get into the bottle works details, I wanted to share a few pictures of my work outside of tile restoration. Um, this is a canal mosaic mural I did as part of the Arts Council mural program. 
And like Suzanne mentioned, I attended Heron School of Art and Design in the late 1900s, <laughs> which <laughs> I got my BFA in 95 and then began my own studio practice. And I was actively showing my work and teaching simultaneously for several years. Um, I do some uh, period inspired tile. So this is not a, a restoration piece. This is period inspired historic looking tile that's in a nonprofit organization. And this serves as a donor recognition wall for Joy's House Adult Daycare Center. And these are all handmade tiles. Um, eventually I began offering my services for historic tile restoration because I noticed the need for it and people started reaching out and asking me if I'd do this since I was already making tile, I thought I should get into this. <laughs> so um, one of my earlier projects was this fireplace at the McKay house, which is just a few blocks from here. Um, this house was built in the late 1880s and my project was to go in and replicate the tiles on the corner of the fireplace that were missing. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> the um, picture on the left shows part of the process. So what I had to do is make a hand carved clay tile, but I had to account the shrinkage of the kiln firing. So I couldn't just cast a tile right off of the originals. I had to actually um, bump that up by about 15%, 12 to 15% to account for shrinkage, hand carve it to match the original, and then make a mold to cast multiples. Um, as long as I can remember, the Coke building looked like this. Um, I lived on the Near East side of Indy for many years and drove past it every single day. The glazed exterior terracotta always caught my eye and I always thought what a shame it was to be used for a school bus parking lot. Here's an interior shot from when IPS owned the building shortly after they moved out. Um, I never imagined the interior was actually full of art deco tile with all of that gorgeous detail. Um, and I never thought I would actually be working on in, uh, the restoration. So fast forward to where we are today. Um, I became involved in the Bottle Works restoration by referral from a fellow Heron alum and by being listed on the Indiana Landmarks database of preservation contractors and consultants as a ceramic tile maker for historic restoration. So these photos show um, the original Coca-Cola lobby and then the lobby how it looks now. My initial tour of the building was in 2018 with Ratio Architects. After a series of meetings, a few months would go by and we would meet again and then more time would pass and then we would meet again, um, several months in between each meeting as they were going through the building and identifying all the aspects of restoration and the new construction. So these projects take a lot of time in planning before we even get to the actual restoration or construction part. And as with any remodeling job, the tile is usually the last phase of the project. This shows some of the damaged tiles, the first tour I had in the building that were slated to be replaced. I do some tile installation myself where I install it and grout it. But after seeing this building, I knew it was beyond the scope, scale and scope of my personal ability as an individual artist. So I proposed providing the tile replicas and then a larger tile construction crew would do the install, the removal and install. So the next few slides kind of jump around a little because there were a lot of moving parts in the process. So when IPS owned the building, it was a warehouse storage facility and they put this big hole in the wall in the lab on the second floor to run duct work. <laughs> um, at the time, I'm sure they didn't realize it was gonna become a boutique hotel someday. <laughs> 
Um, this is a elevation print provided by Ratio Architects. They took on the tedious process of it, identifying each and every tile that needed to be replaced. Um, if you look closely at this, and I have another slide with a detail, each tile is numbered with the type of damage and replacement or repair it needs. Um, most of my work is in the main lobby, the laboratory, which is the second floor, that green tile room, and the powder room on the second floor, and the hallway on the second floor. A variety of colors, sizes, and sheens were required to complete the restoration. So this shows the detail of that elevation. They used a very detailed assessment system and actually the number of tiles that they identified from the original assessment increased quite a bit by the time we actually got into production because um, as they were removing a damaged tile, some of the pieces around it would come loose or break, which is pretty common. Um, another aspect of that is if a tile just has a hairline crack, they would probably leave it in place if it's not structurally compromised because removing that can actually do more damage for more tiles around it. So let's see, here's more of the before pictures. In the winter of 2019, which was more than a year after my initial tour of the building, um, the Santa Rosa team began removing tiles marked for replacement and then bringing them to me to just test the colors. So at that point, I was just testing, doing color samples, um, not production yet. This shows the uh, medallion in the terrazzo floor in the spiral staircase entrance. Um, this was done by Santa Rosa Tile Company, who also did the restoration work on the hotel. Um, they've been around since the 1920s and they're still operating out of the original facility located just a few blocks from Bottle Works. Um, let's see. So their team was responsible for all the tile on-site installation, and they also did all of the brand new tile in all the hotel rooms. So I was basically a subcontractor for Santa Rosa as a tile supplier. Here's more. This is in the process of removing the damaged tiles. Uh, Santa Rosa, like I said, did the, the lion's share of the on-site work. So I want to make sure they're credited for the partnership here. Um, their team carefully removed each and every tile and installed the new tile that I delivered. And they were really awesome to work with. And I'm so glad I got to work with such a big historic company, local company. see. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> this is a detail of some of the removals. Um, this shows the areas where the tile was removed. And there was a Santa Rosa guys used the color coding for the lobby tiles because that pattern is so wacky. So they had their own labeling system. DB is dark blue, LB is light blue, and so on. And of course, as an artist, I had to complicate matters when we talked about the colors because I would refer to it as dark turquoise, not dark blue, or light turquoise, or like they called the burgundy tiles red and I called them burgundies. <laughs> we had to get on the same page on that. And white, it's not white, it's off-white or ivory. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, this is the back of one of the original tiles taken out of the lobby, stamped 8-E-T-C-O on the back. Um, American Encaustic Tile Company, also known as ETCO. Uh, that company was founded in Zanesville, Ohio, and was around from like 1875 until about 1945 as one of the largest tile manufacturers in the country. Um, this informa information helped me determine my approach to producing tile for this project, knowing that it was originally factory made, not handmade. Their showroom was in New York City and their manufacturing facility was in Ohio. Um, they mass produced encaustic tile, dust pressed tile, and glazed ceramic tile for homes and commercial buildings. 
and their goal was to make affordable factory tile that could be purchased at places like Woolworths. The Zanesville, Ohio area is known for natural clay deposits and it's still mined today, um, which is why ETCO chose to build their factory along the banks of the river there. This shows the historic factory. Uh, looks like a couple acres <laughs> of buildings. And the lower photos show the type of machines that would have been used during the production for the, around the same time period as the Coca-Cola tiles. Later on, um, ETCO became Shawnee Pottery, and there were also over a dozen other industrial potteries in that area uh, throughout history, like um, Roseville and Weller, if you're a collector, those names might ring a bell. So that factory is quite a stark difference to my 1,000 square foot clay studio here in Indianapolis. <laughs> Um, which is pretty big for me. I gradually worked up to a studio that size, but this is where my studio is. It's, this is where the magic happens. <laughs> um, we began to ramp up the Bottle Works production in about March of 2020, and we all know what happened at that time. So there, were a lot, there was a lot of uncertainty in whether we were gonna continue the project or put it on hold. You know, things were getting closed down and uh, construction was deemed essential and hotels are essential. So we, can, we were able to continue the work. But um, a lot of, it was like a ghost town. Everybody was staying home at the time and, and a lot of places were closed. So I actually took that picture of the parking lot at my studio in March of 2020 when I showed up to work one day and it was totally empty. That's very unusual for our studio complex. There are a lot of, it's a mixed use business com complex. So there's a lot of um, salons and other artists there. It was just a ghost town. Kind of an eerie time. Let's see. All right, back to the tiles. <laughs> okay, so we know where the original tile came from and how they were made. And this information, plus the quantity and the timeline I had to work with, led me to source factory-made tiles for as much of the project as I possibly could. There were areas where it was impossible to find a factory replica, so I had to handcraft the bull nose and the corner caps and some of the unusual shaped tiles. So you can see the top corner is a stack of bisque factory tile, and then the bottom picture is a handmade tile process to try to replicate the black bull nose that's in the um, laboratory. So I sourced four inch and six inch square tiles from Dow, direct from the Dow Tile Factory Warehouse. And that ensures that the tiles are gonna be perfectly sized, nice and flat and smooth and ready to use. Um, oh, I should mention the term bisque. So the tiles in the upper corner have been fired once and that's called bisque fired. So I ordered them bisqued so that they would be less fragile when they ship them instead of sending like just dried clay tile. And then um, bisque also refers to handcrafted ceramic wares. So it's, it's a term that can be used not just in factory tile, but handcrafted work. It's basically the first kiln firing to harden the clay. And then after that, it goes into another firing to add the glaze. So a piece of pottery or a tile can be referred to as bisque, or the firing itself could be a bisque firing if it's the first firing to harden the clay. More fun studio pictures. <laughs> um, after bisque firing, ceramics gets glazed and then fired a second time, sometimes at a higher temperature. We refer to that simply as the glaze firing. And sometimes it takes multiple kiln firings. Um, I use an electric kiln and fired these tiles for this project to about 1,900 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually considered low fire in the world of ceramics. Uh, to match glaze color, start by mixing little miniature batches of different ratios of the colors I think will maybe come close to the color of the tile. 
and I get to this point from just getting to know my glaze palette from the different manufacturers that I've used for decades. I learned to mix glazes in college and a lot of potters will mix their own glazes if they want like a large batch of one color, but it's not very practical if you're changing the color every time you do a new project. So for my custom projects, I actually use a lot of commercial glazes that I've gotten to work with over the years. Um, there's actually a glaze manufacturer here in Indianapolis called Amico, and they employ glaze chemists that can um, formulate a glaze and test it and do all of that and to a specific temperature. You're late. <laughs> so they, they have somebody doing all the tried and true testing before I buy it in a pint. But I still have to test these glazes because different clay bodies and kilns can yield different results. Um, the testing phase can take multiple kiln firings in a few weeks just to land on a color to match the original. Um, it takes about eight hours for a kiln to fire and then another day for it to cool down before you can open it and see the results. Sometimes 12 hours if you're antsy and speed up the cooling process. Um, after the first attempt, micro batch with the color bars, then I'll identify which colors worked the best and then do larger tiles to kind of see how it looks then on the tile, the actual size of tile. Glaze is not like paint. You can't go into the glaze store and take the tile and match it like you can at Sherwin-Williams. It absolutely has to be tested on the clay you're using and kiln fired to see the result. Um, after finding a match, there can even still be variations in subsequent firings, if you, even if you do the same thing over and over again, uh, which is kind of frustrating, but also a fun challenge in ceramics. Oh, one other thing about this pink tile. So this is from the powder room on the second floor. And some of the tiles in the lobby also have an aged patina, like a yellowing to it, even after scrubbing and cleaning with industrial cleaners. And we think that might be just, or we know it's just a patina from aging. And um, the cracking also is from aging because the matte tiles and the satin tiles, the glazes will kind of absorb staining and things like that. Oh, and we think that maybe the staining was from smoking indoors for several decades in this building. All right, here's some of the original tiles next to some of my replicas. And as you can see, the original tile on the left has, you know, damage and crazing. And like I said before, um, the satin glazes can absorb some patina. The crackle pattern is known in ceramics as crazing, and it's due to conditions over time on satin and matte tiles. You cannot feasibly formulate a satin or matte glaze that can craze as a newly fired tile. It's possible, but it's not common. Um, so glossy glazes are more prone to crazing, and you can even get glossy glazes to craze or crackle on purpose. But with the satin and matte, that's actually fairly impossible to do. So um, we decided to try to sort of do a faux finish of that crazing pattern by screen printing a pattern with an underglaze over the opaque colors and then fire it in the kiln and that's the result of the lower triangle. Um, after taking that one and the non faux finished one into the space, we decided to stick with the solid opaque color and not do the faux crazing. Because uh, screen printing the crazing, you know, screens have a certain line thickness and we couldn't get it fine enough. So that was a fun challenge that we, sometimes you test and test and then decide not to do that. A lab on the second floor. Um, we think that the original transparent green tile for the lab has been chosen for its similarity to Coke bottle green glass. And the green glass of Coke bottles is a result of minerals used 
casting glass, and a lot of the same minerals in glass are also used in glazes. Glazes have a similar property in makeup with silicates derived from quartz and melting agents known as fluxes and mineral colorants to create a color. And then the, the glaze melts on the surface and becomes vitreous on the surface of a tile. One nice thing about the lab color is there were tons of variation in that green glaze. So if you look at the wall, there's lights and darks and mediums, which made it a lot more forgiving to match. And then I achieved those variations by layering the glaze thicker in some areas. Uh, this shows the approval or rejection process of glaze samples. <laughs> I did several rounds of glaze tests simultaneously while producing quantities of tiles for colors that had already been approved. And the approval process sometimes took four to six weeks from the time I submitted a sample to got a yay or nay on it, go back to the drawing board. Um, I constantly had a round of tiles or glaze tests in the pipeline as I was waiting for approval from new colors. And as I mentioned, the first big production of tile quantity was the lab tile, the green. And I glazed about 650 green four inch tiles for the lab. And then handcrafted a handful of black bullnose and border tiles, which you'll see later on. And it seems like a large project from my perspective as an individual artist, this is considered small batch tiles in the, in the tile industry. Oh, these are fun. So swizzle sticks <laughs> is what the old timer tile guys call these small border tiles. And I just love that. Um, I made about 20 of these that were in the hallway. So in between the slabs of stone on the wall in the hallway are these little thin border tiles that are black and white. And after inspecting the original, which is horizontal on the top, and then the vertical ones are the ones that my, repl my replicas. Um, after inspecting it, I, it was not hand painted. It must have been screen printed, fired on decals originally um, when it was first made even 100 years ago a process used to crisp images on ceramics and you may see it on plates and things like that too and it's still a process we use today in ceramics instead of screen printing a decal i was able to scan the original tile alter it in photoshop to the color shades that i want send it off to a decal printer and then receive the decal Together. So here's some uh, before well. to get an for months and maybe still come back and land on that.
the, the closest is not exact, but the best we could do in the time we had. Um, I usually guarantee about 80% match with tile reproductions. That's my goal. Sometimes I get closer. So back in the studio, um, after the second floor was complete, we moved on to the lobby, which had like five different colors of tile and then about three different sheens. I'll get into those. Um, for the lobby tiles, I used an air compressor and a glaze spray gun to apply the glazes. That eliminated the look of brush strokes that are obvious in the satin. If you hand paint the satin and matte glazes, you can tend to get brush strokes. So spraying the glaze gives you a nice even coating that resembles the factory made tile. This one rack of tiles has seven to eight layers of sprayed underglazes and glaze, and it has to dry in between every coat. Um, so it's quite an assembly line. They have about two coats of white base coat underglaze because the factory bisque clay tile can be a range of whites, grays, or beiges when, you know, when they arrive. So I coated it with white first in order to get a consistent background like canvas, basically. Um, after the two coats of white, two to three coats of opaque turquoise, and then two to three coats of clear satin gla overglaze. Also, this was happening, again, early on during the pandemic when masks were being debated, and I was wearing a respirator for about six hours a day in a studio by myself to protect my own lungs. Here's some of the dark and light blue in the large kiln. And this is about 200 turquoise tiles counted and ready to pack. In the upper right corner, corner you'll notice those small pieces are the corner caps and those were handcrafted, um, like the bullnose tiles that I'm gonna talk about too. Uh, here's those pesky yellow tiles in the large kiln, and I had to create a total of about 200 of those, and I just got about 50 per kiln load. Um, these are the ivory or white tiles, and there's about 100 of those triangles here. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about the triangles, so they're literally a diagonal half of the uh, six inch tiles, but instead of glazing them and then cutting them on a wet saw, we decided to cut the tiles first so that they had a nice clean, crisp glazed edge. If you've ever done any DIY projects at home, you know that when you cut a tile on even a hand cutter or a wet saw, you can get little chips in the edges. So that's why we chose to, we would get the bisque tile from Dow Tile, cut it on the wet saw, then glaze it and fire it. All right, here's where the clay work happens. This is uh, the steps to making a bullnose tile. And this, of course, happens after I've already tested, done some test tiles to figure out the shrinkage and everything, and I make a template based on the final size that I need. Again, um, the clay shrinks around 12 to 15%, so I have to do a few tests to figure out exactly the size to make the tiles before I go into production. Um, I had to make about 36 of these six inch bullnose tiles with terracotta clay. Um, this was, let's see, excuse me. And this shows hand forming the slabs after I roll them in the slab roller and I keep a consistent thickness, um, then I form them around a one inch dowel rod to get that radius. I let them stiffen and then shave the edges and kind of clean them up. So it's a lot of kind of make a piece, set it on, set it aside, let it stiffen, come back and fix it until before it's dry. And then after it's totally smoothed out and ready to dry, it goes on the drying rack covered up to dry slowly for about two weeks to avoid warping in, in the drying part of the process. 
if I needed a larger quantity of these bull nose, I would have made a plaster mold to crank out like a hundred of them, but I only needed about 30. So that was doable and manageable doing them handmade instead of uh, mold pressed. So here's more bull nose. In addition to the burgundy bull nose, I glazed about 80 burgundy six inch factory tiles for the bottom rows along the room in the lobby. They are not shown here, but you'll see. So after I pulled them from the kiln, oh, and that shot is my little baby test kiln. So if I wanna do a small batch of like six or eight tiles, I can stick it in this tiny kiln. Um, and then after they come out, I like to double check them and put them on the table layout before I send them off and pull out any that have flaws. So as we were working on this project, we tried to decode the meaning, the meaning of the original tile design. We thought maybe the burgundy tile around the doorways were to mimic like the shape of a Coke bottle and the little tiny mosaic tiles above the door maybe represent the fizz in a Coke bottle. We're not sure if that was what they were going for, but it was fun to come up with stories like that. Um, the colorful tile along the wall, once you step back and look at it, kind of resembles a plant motif. And we thought that was maybe a, a nod to sugarcane or corn being Coca-Cola in Indiana. Um, who knows, we don't have any records of what the interior designer was thinking when they designed this. But we do know that the stair step design is actually a common design used in, archi in Art Deco architecture. Um, the building on the lower right is the Marine Building in Vancouver that shows that same same stair step. And then the designs on the lower left are like Mayan revival patterns that you see in a lot of Art Deco. In fact, those patterns are actually in the um, circle tower that I showed earlier too. So at some point in the past, they replaced a row of tile, those turquoise tiles that sticks out like a sore thumb to me. Because they were in there and not compromised, they chose to leave them in place and not pull those out and replace them. Um, the vertical row on the right is the replacement and the vertical row on the left is the original turquoise. So you can kind of see the difference there. I see it. <laughs> That's not my work. <laughs> uh, so if you see that part, that's not mine. Now, notice the row of tile spacers in this picture. That shows a row of tile that was replaced. And you can see that my replacement tiles came a little closer to the turquoise than that previous small repair. So a lot of people have said to me, I can't wait to see your tile work at the bottle works, but the point is you shouldn't be able to see it. It should blend in seamlessly. And even I have to kind of look for it when I'm in there, which is fun. Um, this picture on the left shows a, a solid row of bullnose replacement. So like the bottom four pieces are all new tiles. And then the other corner, I believe, are old tiles in a different doorway. So you can see the similarities there. And then the little turquoise pieces are also replacements in that picture. Let's see. So I believe this is around the entrance, the main entrance to the building, not the you know, spiral staircase entrance, but the main entrance into the lobby. And you can see how the door was torn up and the tiles were torn out. And this shows some of those turquoise corner caps on the edge that I made for replacements. And then we're gonna jump back around to some other parts of the building to look at some more um, after pictures. So these are little bins in the laboratory and they were originally used to hold Coke, cap, Coke bottle caps as, throughout the bottling process. There's a really nice long view of the lab, which was one of my favorite rooms. Okay, so remember one of my earlier pictures of the IPS building? 
um, the room with the wood paneling and the shelving and the drop ceiling is actually that green laboratory. So this is my favorite side-by-side -side comparison of before and after. And um, one of the architects said what a surprise it was. They didn't know that that tile was behind that wood paneling. So when they popped the drop ceiling out, they, they could see the glazed tile behind that. And you can kind of see that top picture shows looking up over the wood paneling and into the drop ceiling. And the windows, the clerestory windows were all covered up, painted over, boarded up, whatever, and then wood paneling. <laughs> so that's quite a transformation. That's one of my favorite side-by-sides. All right, so when, when I visit the Bottle Works, this is where my eyes go. I just look at the tile. There's a lot going on in that building, but this is kind of like the view that I like to take when I'm walking around and inspecting things. And also I wanted to point out this little cylinder to the right is a hand sanitizing station, which we would not have necessarily seen something like that in a hotel before COVID times. So that's kind of an interesting detail that they thought to include. Um, here's another during or wrapping up pictures. So this was after we had installed the tile, we, the Santa Rosa, and they were wrapping up the final stages. And the, you can see the ceiling tiles being painted. So those were plaster accents and a different artisan cast those and reproduced those out of plaster and put them back in. So a lot of the on-site work was like a choreographed dance of, of contractors coordinating tasks so they're not bumping into each other. And then here is an after picture from that same perspective. So this is what the Bottle Works Hotel lobby looks like now. And then here we are, this is it. Um, this photo was courtesy of Geronimo Hospitality, which is the hotel owner. And this concludes my talk on the interior tile of the Bottle Works Hotel. So thank you everybody for listening and for coming. And We're going to spend some time answering questions. If anybody has any questions, I can try to answer them to my best ability. We do have a question. Have you ever done a project this large before? No. <laughs> Simply no. <laughs> I haven't. Yeah, this is this is pretty big. <laughs> yes. Would I do one again? Yeah, definitely. Um, which, to go back to this situation of working during the pandemic, normally I would bring in assistance for a project this large, but you know we were not sure about having, I wasn't sure about having people in my studio. And then one of the skilled artists that has worked with me before to, as an assistant had to stay home with her children because they were home indefinitely. So, you know, all kinds of weird stuff happened throughout this project that wouldn't happen during a normal project. But yes, I'd definitely do it again. <laughs> yeah, we had a that someone uh, most of the time, yeah, most of the work is uh, made to order and I do it all on my own. And if I have a large project, I'll bring in an assistant. You have a question back here. Oh, so the question is, was IPS good stewards of the building? Um, I think in some ways, yes, because some of the areas they covered were well preserved. But then again, you see the giant hole knocked through the wall to run duck <laughs> So I think that would be a good question for one of the architects. That's, that's, I, that's a maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so the color matching process, are you, do you eyeball that? I mean, how do you, I mean, are you referring to people in? I know that it's approved too, but is that just something you're eyeballing? 
Um, yeah, for the most part. So the question was, is my color matching process um, just like eyeballing it? And yeah, that's basically how you start. I mean, and sometimes I'll take some tiles and look at them under the lighting in my studio and then take them outside and then look at them in the space where they need to go. So it's um, just a lot of understanding how to look at color over the years and, and see real subtle differences. And then from there, you just decide what your next approach is going to be. Does that answer your question? <laughs> oh, yeah, we've got another question. Um, you ask, is there a technology used in that, in the color matching? Right. Yeah, there's no technology for that in ceramics. It's all just getting to know your glaze palette, really, and just understanding um, where to start from experience. Yeah, and just getting to know, you know, the types of glazes and underglazes to use. Like, for example, with the satin um, turquoise color, it's like an opaque turquoise. So I had to decide, do I want to use an underglaze with a satin clear coat or do I want to use a commercially made satin glaze that has the colorant mixed into it and tested different things, you know, so knowing the options and then testing those is how I get to the results. But yeah, like I said, it's not like a, a house paint. You can't scan it into the machine and have the ratios printed out for you. Yeah, the, um, maybe the large manufacturing plants have that technology. I'm not aware of it. That's a good question I should look into. I do know that if they try to do special runs of special colors with like Dow tile, they would have to order like a ridiculous amount. So they needed a couple hundred of each color. And I think they'd have to order thousands of one specific color to get a special run. And I don't know how a factory like that would go about matching it, honestly. Um, but I'm sure there would still be testing involved. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question back here? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the original tile was, you know, we don't know what it was kind of, uh, I guess you would say, you know, there's not a lot of time in the later, because all the time is really lost. Is there like a power saving tool in that tile? Is there a glaze that you want? Is there a restoration process that you can kind of make it look so real? Well, it's just cleaning them, really. So the question, I'm, I need to repeat for the Zoom viewers, um, the question was from when it looked really dull in the beginning and then really shiny and bright afterwards, was there any kind of polish that we use on the tile? And it really, it's just um, like commercial cleaning to get it to that state. And also the before pictures were dusty, you know, with construction dust and things like that. So just a good solid cleaning. Like if you have tile at home, you know, the same way you would approach cleaning your bathroom tile would give you that shine. Do you have a Zoom question? Yeah, we've got Zoom uh, questions for Charleston. Mm -hmm. And maybe probably my sister. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I ruined it. No. Okay. Oh, it's very challenging. Um, definitely a little different than my normal projects. I do a lot of handmade, made-to-order work, and this was kind of thinking on a more massive scale. So. Um, also working with developers and, you know, construction crews and architects, I tend to work one-on-one -on -one with clients, like when I do a fireplace in their home or even with an interior designer who, you know, I meet one-on-one -on -one and maybe with the client. So this was definitely challenging, but also fulfilling, a, a good challenge. Yeah. Any other questions? One back here. How big of the contract? Um, big. <laughs> so they reviewed 
bids from like lots of different um, tile companies to do that removal and installation, but I believe, well, like I said before, the, the new hotel room's tile fell under that same contract. So it's funny because this restoration work to me was a big, the biggest part of it. But for them, they were doing um, commercial tile in 139 hotel rooms, brand new tile. So that, you know, was a lot of work for them. And they were using, um, if you visit the hotel and see the uh, tile in the bathrooms, and this was fun because the guys know I like to be a nerd about tiles. When, when they were installing the bathroom tiles in the hotel rooms, they're like, you got to come and see this. They're using these giant sheets. This is something new in like the tile industry. These giant like four by eight sheets of porcelain tile that look like marble. And they were, you know, able to cut them on a wet saw and things like that. So that was one of their, like a huge part of their project was that. Anything else? Well, I want to thank Barbara, and also uh, we have we did have some uh, technical difficulties during the Zoom, so uh, sorry about our, our audio for that. Um, we are learning as we go, and appreciate everybody's patience. Um, <laughs> Thank you, John. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, appreciate that for our Zoom audience. And thank you so much for coming. Thanks to all of our members. For those of you that are not members, we'd love to have you join and help us stay in the places and watch email for a link to a discount membership that we will be continuing. Thank you very much. Thank you.